Yeah, thanks, Brian. We have a special announcement as we're getting going this morning, and it's about a conference that we're doing in, at the end of the month. It's called Invitation to, to Racial Righteousness. I have a hard time saying this one fast, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to botch it up a few times, but there's a conference coming up at the end of the month, and it's really important to the life of our church. So we've been given this vision to become a church that unites diverse people, and uh, there's a transformational process that kind of goes with it. Last fall, we had a church retreat here at Access, um, and for many of us, it was one of the most memorable retreats we had in a long time. Uh, we had comments from people who were saying, like, I've never had a chance to talk about my racial journey, about what it means to be, uh, you know, a person of faith and a person of color, or how does it all work together? And uh, one of the, the comments that I received at the end of the conference that really stuck with me was from someone who was new to the church who said, um, you know, he wasn't a person of faith, but he was saying that, you know, this is the first place I've been able to talk about race stuff without getting all hot and bothered in an argument. And he just wanted to thank me for that. And so it was a really, really interesting moment. And as we think about this vision that God has given us, uh, I really want to invite you to consider coming to this conference because it's the next step in our journey. It's the next step from the retreat to this. Uh, and this is helping us to become people of peace, who can speak peace, who can create peace, the peace of Christ, who can help people connect with the peace of Christ. Um, and it depends upon us kind of journeying through some uncomfortable spaces, uh, talking about race, talking about conflict, and learning about how we can find better solutions. So I really want to invite you and challenge you to do this. Now, uh, along the way, this, this was kind of disappointing this week. Uh, we had a partner church who was going to join us in the conference. Um, and unfortunately, they had to back out. So I sent out some emails to some other pastoral friends and said, hey, you want to come to a conference in a month? Um, so a lot of them are considering it and, and seriously thinking about it. Some of them have been to something like this, and they are making a call to their own people to come because they believe in it. So I want to challenge you to, to come to it. You know, spend the weekend with us thinking about racial righteousness and praying and going through this journey with us together. Sound good? All right. So uh, we're going to hop right into our message today, and we are in a series um, called A Church That Unites Diverse People, and we're going through different stories through the book of Acts in order to talk about how God brought this unique gathering together in the ancient world called the church. And the church was a collection of people from different races, different ethnicities, different cultures, different languages, even different religions. They came together to follow Jesus. And it's been this interesting journey for us to follow along in because it's got tremendous relevance to the, the world that we live in today for how we function as a church. And in particular, today, we're going to talk about the question of how. How did this happen? How did this function? How did diverse people come together in Christ? Uh, and how did, how did the Apostle Paul build a bridge so that people of other faiths, other religions, could come to know Jesus. And this is relevant for us because that same mission impulse, that same call to share the gospel, is what God calls us to today. So, if some of you here, or most of you here, consider yourself a Christian, a follower of Jesus, right? The gospel came to you at some point. You know, whether you're young or maybe older, maybe through a family friend or, a, or a, a neighbor, maybe through a Bible study or maybe through summer camp, you know. Um, however it went, at some point along the way, the gospel came to you. You know, I, I have shared this story many times here that I came to faith uh, by the invitation of my best friend, Mike, who invited me to go to church to meet girls. Um, and I met God along the way. Um, he didn't have quite the same experience, but um, it turned everything around for me. And the expectation is the same, that, that you and I would go out and share this with others, with our neighbors, with our friends, our family members, 
So we're going to talk about how this happened in the ancient world with Paul and learn a few things and talk about how this might apply to us. And then we're going to finish today um, with the communion elements, with the bread and the cup that remind us of who we are in Christ, the place that we've been given, and this kind of new identity that we have in Jesus. Now, before we start, we're going to pray, of course. Um, and I don't know what your week has been like. My week feels really, like, crazy. Um, from contaminated water to my mom has been sick and she had to go to the hospital. And um, we've had friend, uh, Pastor John sick. He couldn't make it today, so Brian filled in for him. There, there's a lot of folks that are going through different things. I don't know what your week has been like. But before we get into the message, I would just like to sort of consecrate the moment. So let's, let's pray. God, this morning, I am sort of in an in-between space, and I feel like my brothers and sisters here are in that too. You've given us as a church this high calling and this vision to be a church that unites diverse people, and yet in this moment, I am also, also feeling the tensions of every day of all the different life things that I've been given, uh, and I come to you with all of it, and I bring all of us together in this moment of prayer to know that you are a God of peace and grace. And you hold all these things together. And as you call us forward in your word this morning, I pray that all of us would listen well. And I pray that you would also take up our worries and our fears, the anxiety that, as Jessica had mentioned earlier, to be able to know that you are a God who cares. We pray this in the strong name of Christ. All right, so we'll hop right in. Okay, so church that unites the first people, we're in Athens in Acts chapter 17, and we're in the second half of this chapter. So this is the story so far. The apostle Paul has had to leave his previous context where he shared the gospel with a bunch of people, and people are after him. They're kind of pursuing him. So his missionary friends are staying in the city to help this new early church grow in discipleship and, you know, learn the ways of Jesus. And he's gone to the great city of Athens. And here he's alone and he's starting to teach the gospel to other people. He's sharing the story. So let's go through Acts 17. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in a synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? <laughs> Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to the meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who live there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Okay, so if you can kind of catch the scene, Paul has been speaking the gospel, and to people who've never heard it before, this sounds like babbling, you know? It's just like, I don't understand a word you're saying. What, what is this? It's, it's a little intriguing, but I don't get, get it. So they invite him to the meeting of the city where people discuss these ideas. It's, it's kind of an honor for someone like him. He's a newcomer to the city. These people don't have the context of scripture or they don't know about Jesus. And so here he is. He's given this chance to speak to the ideas, the thought leaders of the day. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and he said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Yeah, pretty bold. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, 
and does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and we move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that we are, that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day which he will judge the world with justice. By the man he has pointed, he has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Okay, another long chunk, but here we go. Paul is laying out the gospel, but if you kind of compare this with all the stories we've been going through so far, this is a little different. He is not quoting a lot of scripture here. I mean, if you were giving a sermon, if I gave a sermon like this, I'd get complaints, right? So he is giving a sermon here, and he's not using a whole lot of scripture, but he's saying that Jesus is Lord, okay? This is where he's going. Uh, we'll talk about why he's doing this in a few minutes, uh, but this is the final response. Uh, Acts 17, oh, the last couple of verses. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead... Some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject, and that Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them were Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, and also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Okay, two responses here at the end of the story. Um, Just to notice, the first is sneering, you know kind of a weird, I don't use sneering as a vocabulary word much. Uh, It also means mock. Um, Literally, it means to throw out the lip. You know, as as I was reading this at home, I was like, hmm, I wonder what that, (laughs) wonder what that, that would do to people in the ancient world. It was kind of an insult, you know, it's like, boo on you, Paul. I mean, you're just babbling, I don't get it. Um, It's like the thumbs down of Facebook. They, They threw out the lip, we do thumbs down. Um, the other response was they listened. There were people who listened, they followed, and they believed. And interestingly enough, they became followers of Paul before they became followers of Jesus. Because these folks, they didn't grow up with the Bible, they didn't know the stories, and they were just kind of going along with it. So what we're going to do today is look at three insights from Acts about how Paul kind of negotiated this new world And then we're going to talk about three conversations that we might get into to help build bridges with those who may not have faith in Christ. So first, how did Paul build a bridge and connect with others? The first insight is this, that he he started with what others understood. He started with their ideas and their vocabulary. This is really interesting. So if you kind of go back in the text a little bit, you notice that Paul uh, met these different philosophers. Some were Stoics, and some were Epicureans, right? And so um, if you're unfamiliar with uh, some of the thought process, uh, or it's been a while since you've taken philosophy, here's a little refresher for you. Um, So any Star Trek fans out there? All right, yes. I, I know I'm not alone, and you don't have to be ashamed or feel any shame if you, I've, I've been to Star Trek conventions. Um, <laughs> the Stoics were people who believed in logic and discipline, okay? To be in harmony um, with the world, um, they believed that the, you use reason and logic and discipline, all, and, and all of life sort of came from this common source that was the, with the Stoics. They were the Epicureans. Uh, and these were folks who, who kind of believed in a different school of thought. Um, they pursued happiness. Uh, they believed in many gods, but they also believed that temples were not necessary. Um, the, you know, sci-fi equivalent of these things are Spock and McCoy, you know, so Spock was always interesting, you know, fascinating. You know, he was always fascinated by things, but he was very, rather unemotional, um, 
at least in the original series. Uh, and McCoy was always, I don't get you, man. You know, <laughs> where's your humanity? Uh, and so he, these were the different schools of thought. So the point being this, when we go back to ancient Athens, this is who Paul encountered. These were the people. These were the uh, philosophies of thought. And Paul went throughout the city, and he used in his message to the ancient Athenians a couple of very interesting terms in his message. Verse 24 says, God does not live in temples built by human hands. This was a direct Epicurean thought. He was just quoting their own thinkers. Now, you might read this through the lens of Scripture and think, well, okay, that's a very biblical thought, too. That, you know, Isaiah talks about this, too. But, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of resonance there. Um, and then verse 29, um, Paul says, since we are all God's offspring. You know, he kind of quotes again from um, Stoic philosophers. He's quoting them directly in order to connect with them. Now, you know, in God language or in Christianese, we are... God's family, right? Or maybe we, here at Axis, we say we are a faith village. But Paul doesn't use those terms. He says we are God's offspring. And he does this on purpose because he's trying to connect with people who don't know God at this point. So here at Axis, we try and do something similar, all right? So we try and use less Christian talk, Christianese. Okay, this, so... Some of you who've been in church for a long time know there's like a subset of language that people can use to talk about God. Sometimes it's very highbrow. We talk about like eschatology and sanctification. And, and yeah, we, we not only believe in that, we preach that like all the time, right? I just use different words. In, in the beginning of Access, um, I think because we sometimes use these words instead, they're the functional equivalent. We talked about, you know, God... God knows your true self, or we can talk about how God um, longs for you to be who he created you to be. And we're talking about sanctification. And when we talk about mission, we talk about God redeeming the world. Yeah, we're talking about eschatology. Yeah. But we use less Christianese. We try and use more everyday language. And this is helpful for people to come to faith. And this is helpful for us to examine with ourselves. You know, sometimes we may talk about God, but we don't talk about him in a way that friends and neighbors can understand in in normal, everyday talk. Um, So this is a bit of self-assessment. So, Okay, next insight here. Paul listened for how God was already in their conversations. So in verse 23, Paul says, For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. And this is fascinating. This is really interesting. Because what Paul found was a gap in their culture for talking about God. He found something that was missing in their ideology and yet was important to them. Important enough for them to make an altar, and yet it was kind of still a mystery, a question mark, a question. And he was able to use that to to find space to talk about God. The thing to notice is that God was already in their conversations. What Paul was doing is he was discovering it, finding that, and using that as a way to link them and to build a bridge. Um, the second thing to notice here, as Paul listened in their conversation for how God was present, he says this, that God has marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. So I just underlined that last part there because This is the whole theology behind a lot of our missional assumptions. God is not far from anyone. He's not far from any person. We may not be aware of his presence, but he is present. And when we are on mission with God, we're trying to see where that might be taking place. 
So when I was in high school, um, before I became a Christian, um, this is my, uh, it was my freshman year in high school. I was studying one day in the library, the public library uh, in our city, and I was having a rough day. Things weren't going well, and I was, I guess I was in a mood. I went into the bathroom and was just, just not myself. And a guy was there who is um, a friend. He was an older classmate. He had given me rides a few times after school. Uh, and he was, like, one of the uber-popular kids at school. Was, like, everybody liked him. Um, and, you know, I didn't expect this at all, but he said to me, you know, hey, you know, sometimes when I'm down, you know, I, I pray to God. You know, I, I don't know what you do, but, um, you know, I go to church on the weekend. He started sharing with me the gospel, right? This was, this was weird. It was in the guy's bathroom, <laughs> and I I'd had no context for thinking that he was a person of faith, right? I wouldn't even have considered it. But he noticed something about my facial expression and how I was doing, and he just opened up and started sharing. And I remember that because it left an impression. I didn't fall down on my knees and come to Jesus at that point. But I remembered what he said. And the thought that he was a person of faith who prayed and knew Jesus and was encouraging me when I was down to look to God, that made a difference. I mean, we're talking like almost 30 years later. I still remember that conversation because it was one of the steps that brought me to know God. And I think part of noticing that God is already in the conversations around us is is a kind of a mindset shift. And it is part of the way that we can become a more missional people in line with what God is doing. So, some of the questions that might come our way. What spiritual gaps have you noticed in culture at large? And where might a friend or a neighbor meet God? Are there moments that you notice that a friend or a family member could use a word of encouragement from you? And is there a way for you to build a bridge to help them meet God? Just to kind of um, oops, um, challenge us in this, this is where Paul built those bridges, and we can as well. Okay, third, Paul was there for the process of faith. Okay, some people sneered. But some people wanted to hear more, and they became followers of Paul, and then they became followers of Christ. And this is really interesting, because Paul was their reference point for faith, and they followed him as he taught them about Jesus, about the gospel, about the word of God, about all these wonderful truths that we know in the church, but they didn't know. So Paul became their reference point. Now, it's weird to call them followers of Paul, right? Right? I mean, I'm not sure Paul would have really wanted that. But he became, in a way, their guide, their bridge to Jesus. Um, coming to faith is a process. It doesn't always happen all at once for people. It takes years. There's lots of us here who've been part of Access for years, and it's taken years and years of just being around here to, to make the decision to, to believe and maybe to get baptized and to go forward. We're going to have a baptism up coming up in, in early April. It's going to be a great time, but it's the same thing, you know, of people taking years to discover faith. But this is what we do. Now, just really quick, this is what we often teach here at Access. It's the narrative of Scripture. It's the four-chapter four way of describing what Scripture talks about, that God created humanity. He created the heavens and the earth. It didn't come from just nowhere, the Big Bang or whatever you might want to conceive of it. It came from someone. It came from something. We believe it came from God, and Scripture tells us that God thought all of these things, and he spoke them into being. But there came a moment when there was a fall, a breaking away from God, where humanity fell into two new realities, sin and death. And sin isn't only moral breaking from God, which we often talk about, but it is really this corruption that took place in our souls. And we continue to spin out toward sin and death. And the things that we were created for by God, like love and relationships, caring for the world around us, love turned to hate or to lust. Generosity turned into greed and selfishness. 
we became less than. And if you've ever wondered why we have a moral sense, it was given to us by God. We think about right and wrong because God created us that way. And if you struggle with that, that came from somewhere. And if you're here today and you've ever wondered that, it's not just a cultural phenomenon. Every culture has some sense of right and wrong. We believe that it is given to us by the Spirit of God. The good news, the gospel, is that God sent Jesus to be our Savior, to save, save us from sin and from death. The gospel is not the narrative, but the narrative contains the gospel and is the story and the invitation to you and me. Come and know life in Jesus. It's freely given. And the end is this. It's the story of renewal and redemption. You and I get invited to, to take part in the renewal and redemption of the world, of our souls, of our communities, of this earth around us. All right, so these are the insights. And I want to, in this next section of the talk, talk about how we, you and I, might build bridges of communication or bridges of conversation with the world that we live in. How can we speak to the unknown gods of our day? How can we as access be on mission with God and share these things? So I'm going to suggest three conversations around soul, community, and mission. First, the soul conversation. And this is a quote from a theologian named N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright is one of the most prolific authors of our time, one of the most respected theologians, really smart guy. <laughs> he writes this about something called the strange presence. The strange presence is a subplot of many of the early stories. Abraham keeps meeting God. Jacob sees a ladder between heaven and earth with angels going to and fro. Moses discovers that he's standing on holy ground, a place, in other words, where, for the moment at least, heaven and earth intersect. And as he watches the burning bush, then when Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt, God goes before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. When they come to Mount Sinai, God appears on the summit, giving Moses the law. A considerable part of the biblical book of Exodus is devoted, rather to our surprise, after the fast-paced narrative of the first half of the book, to a description of the portable shrine where God will condescend to dwell in the midst of his people. Evocatively, it is called the tent of meeting. It is a place where heaven and earth come together. So for those of you who've taken on the Bible reading challenge and you got to February and Exodus and you've wondered why are all these chapters about the temple, about every single detail, it is because it is the meeting place of heaven and earth. God cares about this deeply. And these images and these objects of worship were not simply objects of wealth or treasures. It was meant to point us heavenward to know God. Building bridges is about paying attention to holy moments, especially in the lives of others. So, it's like me being in the men's bathroom at the public library. And a classmate notices that I'm downcast and he notices a holy moment, and he dares to speak. Ooh, that's powerful. I was in a conversation um, a few years ago, back when my kids were really involved with swim team. And uh, um, I used to be on the board of our swim team. Some of you guys know, I get invited to all kinds of boards. It's like, I don't know, it's my thing in life. But I was on the swim team board. It just basically meant I met everybody. I took their money and I registered them. I, I met all the families. And uh, one of the guys I hung out with during swim team meets, um, we were just talking and he says, um, finally after, you know, uh, hanging out with somebody, he says, hey, so what do you do? And I told him I'm a pastor. Um, sometimes this is a great conversation. Sometimes this is a terrible conversation. But in, uh, 
on that day, he, he responded with the words, oh, so you, you help people with the moral side of life. I was like, huh. Now, see, people have all kinds of ideas about why you go to church. Why do you go to church? Why are you here on a Sunday? Why am I here on a Sunday? Is it to help people with the moral side of life? Well, I don't know, not sort of. That's really the next thing. The primary thing, it's God. It's Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit. So I said to him, well, actually, I help people connect with God. I say that almost every Sunday here. Right? So it comes off my lips really easily. And, I get, and then he goes, oh. And we started talking for hours after that. It was a conversation opener that helped him to think about church in a new way. Not just the moral side of life. You and I aren't here just for the moral side of life. We are here to connect with the living God who is connected with us through his son, Jesus. And the moral side of life comes as a love for God, a love for his things. We pursue justice and righteousness and goodness because this is the way of Jesus. This is where life is found. It's not that just we want to be better than other people. Not at all. We believe we found life in Jesus. And this is how we build bridges in the soul dimension with people. So first of all, this is the soul dimension of life. And this is the way to build bridges with others. It is to help them see that at the heart of things, you as a follower of Christ are connected with a God who loves you deeply. Next thing. Number two, a community discussion. So here at Access, we talk a lot about community. It's our second kind of thing. We live life with God and soul community mission. So I used to quote this ad nauseum. I don't know. People, I don't know if you got tired of my quoting of it, but I, I still live by this. This is really insightful about our culture. So uh, these two guys, uh, John Cacioppo and, uh, ooh, I forgot his first name, Patrick, um, they wrote a book called Loneliness. Um, I was at Barnes & Noble, I picked it up, saw it, you know, it spoke to me. <laughs> One of the quotes in there said, in 1985, when researchers asked a cross-section of the American people, how many confidants do you have? The most common response to the question was three. In 2004, when researchers asked again, the most common response made by 25% of the respondents was none. One quarter of 21st century Americans said they had no one at all with whom to talk openly and intimately. We are a lonely culture. Loneliness is part of our existence in our contemporary society. It is a feature of life now. It's not necessarily a good thing. Loneliness leads to all kinds of complications. Now, you might think, first of all, well, the antidote to community is just get people to be around people. Just, just get around more people and you, you'll get community and you'll, you'll solve your dilemma. Well, sort of, yeah, kind of. But here's something else that we know. Many of us have experienced our deepest wounds in life because of community. Our friends and our families, they're the ones who've hurt us the most. Unforgiveness. It's one of the most painful things. We have these struggles with people. There's something called shame. It's something we experience with other people. It's not because we're alone. It's because we're with others. Brene Brown, whom many of us love some of her writing, you know, she defines shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection and shame is one of those great community killers it's the reason why many of us are lonely because we check out we don't want to be in a place where we're going to get wounded again and church sometimes has been that place for many of us but the vision that god has given the church is that it would be a community that would be different it would operate by a new ethic by this People are going to know that you belong to me, that you love one another. Wow, this 
the new ethic of love was the ethic of the church. It was the definition of how the church would be together. Love. There's this other word, grace. In Jesus, we find our ultimate acceptance. We are loved beyond our wildest imagination. We find our ultimate home in his kingdom where we are forgiven, we are healed, we are redeemed, we are set free. This is not something we earn. It's grace. This is the gift. When you talk to people about community, if you know someone who is lonely, there is an unknown God. There is a missing piece in their life. And God may be prompting you to share with them this message of grace. That in the kingdom of God, they are welcomed beyond their wildest dreams. Accepted. And their true selves have an opportunity to come and flourish and become who God always designed them to be. This is true community. This is mission. So mission is an interesting conversation to have with people as well. Now, when we planted Access, uh, when we started years ago, um, one of the things that we started right alongside of Access was this nonprofit called Vox Culture. Back in the day, the two were the same. So on Sundays, we had our Access morning gathering, and we had our Access hats on. In the afternoon, we did Vox activities. We just put on our Vox shirts, and we were Vox. Um, these days, the two organizations, organization, uh, the two entities, are like different, and it's important for us to know some of those roots. Some of you don't know that story. Uh, we will talk about it more in days to come. But here's the thing: one of the most significant Vox activities that we did in our early days was this anti-human trafficking um, uh, initiative to get acclimated to it. Um, I went, went around meeting some of the anti-trafficking leaders for our city, the nonprofits, and I just went in as a learner and brought some volunteers along with me to learn about this tragic mess that we have in our, in our world today. And we came back after meeting with people, learning about how bad this is in our city, about learning about the tragic epidemic this is, and we felt terrible. We were crushed. Now, uh, fast forward a year or two later, I was invited to speak at <laughs> an anti-human trafficking conference. I had still very little experience. Um, I was not an expert. I wasn't in law enforcement. I'm not a lawyer. I'm just, I'm, I was the only pastor, I think, uh, invited to speak. And I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to say? You know, all, there's a lot of, you know, justice folks here. And I'm, a, you know, that's, yeah, that's me also, but but I don't know what to say. I kept praying about it. And then I, I, I recalled that story of our volunteers going on this journey to learn about anti-trafficking. And this experience that all of us had of despair. This is utter despair at the darkness of our world. And I realized that the strongest thing that I could give as a, as a messenger of the gospel, as a follower of Jesus was a sense of hope. I could talk about hope. And I can talk about why I'm in this fight against something so dark. It's because I believe that God is in this fight too, that he cares about it, and that in hope, I can, I believe that there is a better way, a better future, a reason why things are going to get better. It's because of God, and because God is in this. That's why I'm in it too. And so if you're in missional conversations with people, if you're in the justice world and you're working against really dark things, you know as well as I do that darkness is very, very real. And one of the ways that we as people of Jesus can continue to point our way to God is to know our sense of hope. Why do you believe that tomorrow will be better than today. 
as we're wrapping up today, I know we're a little long for a, a communion Sunday, but I, I, I hope this was encouraging. I have some conversation questions. You can take a picture of this and use them in your small groups if you'd like to. These are things that will help uh, deepen the discussion. Feel free to discuss them. Whether you're not, you're part of a, a small group, uh, we also just encourage people to talk about when you get home and have dinner or whatever. Just pick a, a question or two and talk about them with your kids or whomever. Um, Read Acts again. Talk about these things. And what is your faith story? Do you have a conversation around soul, community, or mission? But I wanted to end our time today, not only with communion, but with a special invitation for this particular communion table. I'm going to go back to that scripture in just a moment. But I wanted to, to give this invitation to people here. Maybe you're here, and you've been with us for a while at Access, because... Um, you know, this is meant to be a place, whether you believe in Jesus or not, we always welcome you. Uh, and maybe something today just kind of stirred in your soul. And maybe today you just kind of want to step forward in faith and say, I, I really want to follow Jesus. I've heard enough. <laughs> I'm ready to take my first step. The first step doesn't mean you have to know everything. It doesn't mean that you have to, like, be able to answer the hardest questions it just means you're taking your first step. And I'm going to have this prayer up. If you'd like to pray it during communion, pray it and then come up. Take the bread, dip it in the cup, and receive Jesus. Receive this in faith. And in your heart say, I follow you. I'm coming after this. This is for me too. And know that God receives you as you are. You are forgiven. You are set free. This is the first day of a new life for you. Let's read this together, church. First Corinthians. And we be reminded of what these elements mean for us. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, uh, take a few moments now just to pray, commune with God. I'm going to invite the communion service to come up to the front. We'll take the elements first and then come as you're ready.
Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice, for the bread that reminds us of your body, and this cup that reminds us that we are received into this new relationship, this new covenant, this promise that we have new life in you. We thank you when we go from this place. Has changed people who believe in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. invite you all to stand with me as we go from this place. Let's go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Loving God, through all our years, let the church be a community where we learn about love and practice it, where we envision peace and work to build it, where you meet partners in the faith who wish to abandon everything that cheapens our discipleship, where we discover gifts and offer them. May your spirit guide us toward joy and generosity. In Jesus' name, in the way of Jesus, amen, amen. On your way out, make sure to stop by the table and say hello, to, especially if you're new. Uh, greet the people around you, and have a great day. Mm-hmm.